My name is Jennifer Deckel. I'm the Director of Research and Communications at the Endowment for Middle East Truth. We're also honored to have today with us James Woolsey, former CIA Director. Um, recently he's had three op-eds in the Wall Street Journal, uh, one in May on oil and one today on the electromagnetic pulse, particularly in rogue states including Iran, um, which is obviously very important right now. Uh, just a few words on ISIS. In late June, uh, ISIS declared the creation of an Islamic State in large portions of lands including Iraq and Syria. The leader of ISIS, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, has named himself Caliph Ibrahim and now claims authority over all Muslims throughout the world. ISIS is known for its harsh interpretation of Wahhabi Islam, its brutal violence, which is directed at women, Christians, Shia Muslims, non-fundamentalist Sunni Muslims, Yazidis, and many others. It has thousands of foreign fighters in its ranks and has claimed responsibility for bloody attacks on military targets and thousands of civilians. Last Thursday, the President authorized limited strikes against ISIS convoys to defend the American personnel in the area and civilians stranded. And the U.S. has sent Special Operation Forces and Marines to Iraq to, Iraq to help tens of thousands of the Yazidis. I'm proud to, to introduce our speaker today, Thomas Jocelyn, the senior editor of the Long War Journal and a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Thomas Jocelyn has focused his research on how Al-Qaeda and its affiliates opera, operate around the globe. He was a senior counterterrorism advisor to Mayor Giuliani during the 2008 presidential campaign. He has testified before Congress on numerous occasions, including before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, the House Homeland Security Committee, the House Foreign Affairs Committee, the, and the House Judiciary Committee. Mr. Jocelyn is also a frequent contributor to the Weekly Standard. His work has been published in a variety of other publications and cited by the AP, Reuters, The Washington Post, USA Today, Time, Foreign Policy, and many others, and he makes regular appearances on television and radio programs. Without further ado, Thomas Jocelyn. Well, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you to uh, Emmett for having me here today. I really appreciate that. I always uh, value the opportunity to talk to crowds such as yourself about what's going on. Um, one of the things that isn't in my bio is that I'm basically a nerd, uh, a giant nerd. Uh, essentially, I study our enemies in a very obsessively granular way. So basically, at, at 4.30 every morning, I get up and I review about between 150 and 250 Twitter feeds in Arabic and other languages that are run by for example, our enemies. Okay, so this is sort of, that's the approach I come at. It's a very bottom-up approach to understanding what's going on in the world. Uh, very OCD-like, uh, you know, very obsessive. Um, but what I want to do here today is I want to take a step back from that and just give you the big picture, sort of take you through why we are where we are today in Iraq with the Islamic State and what the situation is around the world and how we got there. I find oftentimes that um, there's really not a lot of historical knowledge, even going back just even to 9-11, to what's happened from 9-11 on. You know, amongst the elite in Washington and elsewhere, there's a lot of ignorance about these groups, how they operate, what their goals are. And so things happen, and all of a sudden it seems like, you know, this is a random event or something that just sort of pops up out of nowhere. What I want to say to you as the guy who studies our enemies very carefully, I want to say that these things don't happen out of nowhere. That our enemies have strategic aims, they have strategic goals, and they have game plans for what they want to do. We lack a strategy, they don't. And I want to give you a sort of background on where this all really came from. And taking a step back from the current situation for a second, you know, we often talk about Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State in Iraq or any one of these jihadist groups as being terrorists. And they are that. They are terrorists. But they're more than that. They are political revolutionaries. And what does it mean to be a political revolutionary? Well, a political revolutionary is an ideologue who has an idea about how the world should look. Right? It's an idea about how things should be ordered and structured, how things should be governed. And if you think back through you know, our own history in the West, you, you have a number of different revolutionaries, both good and bad. Oftentimes, you know, a revolutionary isn't such a good guy. right? Um, but you know, think about the happenstance throughout history. And I, I like to start this talk usually by giving a couple quick examples from the West and elsewhere, just to 
put it in context. Think about um, Vladimir Lenin during World War I. Does anybody know the story? In World War I, the German government decides to put Vladimir Lenin on a train back into Russia to lead the Socialist Revolution. The idea was that the German government at the time thought they could neuter the Russian opposition to them by having this you know, socialist leader go in and sort of take control, take the reins of the revolution. Think about the consequences of that idea, of that decision, right? It's just, it's remarkable, isn't it? Just a few decades later, the Soviet Union, after temporarily agreeing to a truce with the Nazis, ends up involved in a brutal war, world war with them, along with others, right? And Lenin basically takes the reins of the revolution inside Russia, and this leads to the rise of the Soviet Empire the Cold War, et cetera, et cetera. It started with a political revolutionary on a train going from Germany into Russia. Now, there are many other forces and factors, but it starts with that ideologue. That's the, that's the catalyst a lot of times of the revolutions. And who does Lenin's Russia or the Soviet Union end up fighting in World War II but Adolf Hitler, a former failed art student? Right? A guy who was a courier or a messenger during World War I. He was a lowly courier, who, one of the most dangerous jobs you can have on the battlefield, running back and forth between the, the, the lines uh, in the trenches to deliver messages between commanders. But he was a revolutionary. He had an idea. And it can seem completely delusional, his idea. And in many ways, it is. And there it was. His, his ideas were delusional. But he was committed to it. And he didn't give up until he managed to achieve some level of success. Going forward, just to give you a couple other quick examples, um, when Chairman Mao, as he's commonly known in China, passed away, the New York Times noted in its obituary that he was just a lowly peasant, a nobody, who rose out of nowhere to basically orchestrate and, and, and sort of inspire a revolution throughout China that we still feel the effects of to this day. Mao became one of the master insurgents of all time in terms of figuring out how to operate as a political revolutionary who wants to upend the existing political order and instill his ideas. Right? Another revolutionary, political revolutionary, we, we still deal with his, uh, the ramifications of his work to this day, is Ayatollah Khomeini. Right? He was a political revolutionary. Now if you go back in time, think about Ayatollah Khomeini. When he's trying to come back into power in Iran, there were many in the West, including at the New York Times and elsewhere, that thought this was a good thing. The Ayatollah was essentially going to be a moderating force inside Iran. Somebody who could, you know, basically guide them to a, you know, sort of a more reasonable government, governance inside the Iranian uh, country of Iran. And of course he wasn't, not by any stretch of the imagination. And the revolution in Iran, if you think about it, you know, wasn't even necessarily started by Khomeini and his followers. It had many different forces, from far left and communist types all across the spectrum. But he was the revolutionary who was committed to his idea. He was the one who came up with a game plan to harness those forces for his own end goals. And that was in 1979. We're standing here in 2014 and we still are dealing with what Khomeini brought about in Iran and his followers. So why do I start off with all these different characters throughout history that you're, you're sort of comfortable with. It, it, very simple reason. When we talk about Osama bin Laden and Ayman al-Zawahiri, we talk about them as being terrorists. We, we have images in our head of 9-11 and sort of the attack on the Pentagon and the World Trade Center. They are all that, right? But they're not just terrorists. They are political, revolu they are political revolutionaries. Bin Laden was a political revolutionary. Ayman al-Zawahiri to this day is a political revolutionary, okay? These are guys who have ideas about how the world should look. So what were their ideas about how the world should look? Their ideas were that essentially the existing Muslim governments throughout the Middle East and all the way into South Asia basically were corrupt and were not following the pure version of Islam as they imagined it. They weren't ruling according to the Sharia law, the harsh law that they thought that society should be governed by. And so that's the problem that they envision. They want to figure out how do we how do we basically usurp the power of these regimes, supplant them with a government that's a government that's actually going to rule on the basis of the laws that we think are divinely inspired, and then essentially from there move on to building Islamic states and eventually resurrecting the Caliphate, which was dissolved in 1924 and was sort of this geopolitical entity that just sort of par excellence in the, in the jihadist mindset. Um, so think about that for a second. These are guys that wanted to create Islamic states or Islamic governments based on their vision of the world. What we see today going on right now is uh, basically the result of that political vision. Okay? In 1988, according to a study by the Rand, Rand Institute, there were three jihadist groups in 1988. That's the year Al-Qaeda was founded, three. Come 2001, there were 22. What happened was that a number of different groups came into Afghanistan, which Al-Qaeda turned into an incubator, and they started spreading their seeds. So from three to 22. Now, not all these groups are Al-Qaeda or Al-Qaeda affiliated, but many of them are. Today, take a guess how many there are around the world. 
49 of the big established ones. These are not the smaller groups, but there are 49 established groups around the world. That is the result of a political revolutionary who is look, who are looking at the world and saying, we need to spread our ideas. We need to spread what we're trying to do around the world and try and spark this revolution. You know, in, in the jihadist world, Osama bin Laden is often referred to as the reviving sheikh. Okay. The reviving sheikh. What does the reviving sheikh mean? Well, as part of their revolutionary doctrine, they came to believe, Al-Qaeda came to believe, that Muslims have gotten away from waging jihad as they're supposed to, as it's mandated by the Quran and other Islamic texts. And so, according to their belief system, they had to inspire Muslims to get back to waging jihad. So they could do all these things like overthrowing governments, implementing Sharia law, and do all, accomplish all their political goals. So very much about what they're about, what they're trying to do, and what they've been trying to do since 1980 is get as, many, as much of the Muslim population involved in jihad as possible. Which brings us to the Islamic State. Now, if you think about it in the political revolutionary terms I, I just gave to you, the Islamic State is trying to accomplish essentially a version of that original uh, political revolutionary ideal that Osama bin Laden and Ayman al-Zawahiri set out to achieve. Um, the Islamic State, as I've covered in very granular detail, and I can give you the ping pong back and forth between al-Qaeda senior leaders and Islamic State leaders, eventually gets disowned by the al-Qaeda senior leadership. And it's not really clear to a lot of people why that is, but I think it's pretty obvious when you get into their doctrine. The Islamic State was disowned by Al-Qaeda because they had differing methods for bringing about the, the Islamic State. Essentially, Al-Qaeda is trying to, to approach this from a much more gradual, long-term perspective. What they want to do is they want to inculcate their ideology in Muslim populations such that when they go to enforce their version of Sharia law, they don't face massive uprisings. Okay? The Islamic State doesn't care about that. The Islamic State is the opposite vision. The Islamic State says, you're going to follow my laws because I've got the bigger guns. At least they do right now. And so, what happened here is there were very, very vehement disagreements about how you, how you go about basically structuring society, how you go about waging this revolution in Syria, Iraq, and elsewhere. That was a big part of the reason why Islamic State got disowned by Al-Qaeda. But here's another reason why it got disowned. It's basically the head of the Islamic State, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, believes and has believed for a long time that he's the rightful ruler of the Muslim world. Okay? He has what I call delusions of grandeur. Right now, now in, 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 here's something about that though. Okay, think back to the other political revolutionaries we just talked about. Think about Mao or Hitler or any of these guys. You know, their aspirations could be described as delusional as well. Right. However, that didn't make them any less violent. It didn't make them any less capable, and it didn't mitigate the impact they had on this world. Right now, what you see from the, the current CIA director, John Brennan, I just recently posted this, is there's, there's some confusion about this. Brennan believes, or has believed, and just on June 29, 2011, he argued, well, we're not going to organize our counterterrorism policies around this idea, this feckless delusion, that's a direct quote, this absurd idea, absurd, direct quote, of trying to resurrect the caliphate, that that's what our enemies are about. This doesn't make any sense. Right? We're not going to organize our policies around this. Three years later to the day, June 29, 2014, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi and his followers declared the caliphate across sections of Iraq and Syria. Okay. Right. Three years to the day. Now here's what's interesting about that. You'll find people in the counterterrorism field, and you can argue with them, and people in the commentariat will say, this is all delusional. They don't really run a caliphate. That's right. They don't really run a caliphate yet. That's not stopping them from killing thousands. That's not stopping the genocide that we're witnessing throughout these two countries. That's not stopping them from moving forward. What we may see as delusional from our Western perspective doesn't make it any less violent, doesn't make it any less real. Okay? And to these guys, it's very real. That's what they're fighting for. And so the Islamic State has brought in thousands of recruits from around the world. I call them usually hotheads, because these are usually the hothead young male jihadist wannabes who come in, and they're willing to do just about anything in pursuit of this goal. One of the things that the Islamic State does is um, it puts, it advertises its war crimes in its videos. They're very upfront about this. Um, there was a video I saw not too long ago, which was one of the more disturbing things I've ever watched, where it was basically at the end of the video, it was about 10 minutes of just basically their greatest hits, from you know wrangling guys in the back of trucks and just marching them off to a slaughter, to bringing guys by a river and, and basically killing them one by one and dumping, dumping their bodies in the river. They are the most ultra-violent group you can imagine the hottest world right now across the world. 
these are the guys who really there's no there's no upper bound to the amount of violence that they're willing to commit. They're willing to do anything. You know, I, when you come to what's going in Iraq right now, what's going on in Syria right now, they have killed anybody who opposes them. Okay, anyone. Now I want you to understand what this means exactly. In Syria, they came into, because there were all these tensions between them and Al-Qaeda senior leadership over the direction of how to run the Syrian Jihad and how to run things, they ended up opposing Ayman al-Zawahiri and his chief representative inside Syria. They ended up opposing the guy, one of the godfathers of Jihad of our time, Ayman al-Zawahiri, they went up against him, and they killed his main representative in Syria, a guy who had served the Jihad going back decades. This guy, Abu Khalid al-Suri, as he was known, I'm sorry, I had a little nerd detail here for a second, um, was a guy who, according to the Spanish government, think about this, according to the Spanish government, Abu Khalid al-Suri actually had the surveillance tapes used for the World Trade Center attacks in his possession in the late 1990s and delivered them from the Al-Qaeda operative who took those tapes to Al-Qaeda senior leadership in Afghanistan. Okay. Abu Khalid al-Suri, he's directly involved in, according to the Spanish government, bringing these tapes from Spain to Afghanistan after they were recorded. But this is, goes back to the whole distinction. Remember, we started this talk with the difference of terrorists versus political revolutionaries. Abu Khalid al-Suri was a terrorist, but he was also a political revolutionary, more importantly so. And what he was doing in Syria at the time of his death wasn't, in fact, planning the next 9-11 or anything along those lines, although maybe he had it in his mind. He may very well have. He was raising an army. And that's what these guys are doing across the globe right now. They are raising armies. Islamic State is basically the most violent or hard line of those armies that are coming, you know, trying to achieve their goals. Um, in that regard, uh, say a couple things about where we are right now. I think it's remarkable that um, if you think back, and I don't want to make this political because there have been a lot of mistakes made by the U.S. government going back to the Bush administration. So if we're going to recount mistakes made in war fighting, we can, we can be here all day. But it's remarkable that the threat is so great in Iraq now that even President Obama, who campaigned on ending the war in Iraq, has decided he had to take some amount of action there. That gives you a sense of how great the danger is and how it's growing. And much of the rhetoric around from the Obama administration has tried to basically say throughout the years that whatever's going on in these countries, these are local matters, if they're running their insurgencies, if they're political revolutionaries, however you want to call it, that's not necessarily a big concern for us because they're not coming directly at us. But yet, if you go back and see and reflect some of the rhetoric, if you review some of the rhetoric that's come out of the administration, you can see that even they're worried to a certain extent about what the Islamic State ultimately represents for us. So where's this going to go? Well, Let's take a little uh, walk through the last couple years of history just to give you a, a stunning example of how quickly this metastasizes. Because think about political revolutionaries again. Think about the example of Lenin. Think about Hitler. Think about these examples of how quickly they sort of come to power and, and bring their violence or evil to the world. As of April 2010, 2010, the Islamic State of Iraq, this is one of the predecessor groups to the current Islamic State, um, basically had a number of their leaders killed or captured by American-led forces. They had their two most important senior leaders were killed in April 2010. They were considered to be, if not on their deathbed, they were considered to be an almost completely diminished force. They couldn't do what they wanted to do. In this basically environment, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the current head of the Islamic State, engineers his own rise to power within the group. And it's very interesting because this Baghdadi wasn't a made man in Al-Qaeda world. This wasn't a guy who was groomed by Al-Qaeda senior leaders. And this was probably one of the first hints of problems they were going to have with the group in terms of the infighting between Al-Qaeda and the group. Um, but nonetheless, he was able to manage his rise to take over this group. Now, it's very interesting if you go back through all this, who engineered his rise within the Islamic State of Iraq? Because it happened to be, in a lot of cases, former Ba'athists from Saddam's regime, who basically had become part of the Islamic State of Iraq. And these Ba'athists, in some cases whose ties to the Islamic State and its Al-Qaeda predecessor actually predated the Iraq War, were actually key, key individuals involved in basically bringing Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi to power. And when you look at the Islamic State today, I often describe it as essentially the, Ba'ath, uh, the bastard child of Ba'athism and Al-Qaeda-style jihadism. Because when you see, when you do the nerd analysis, when you do my nerd analysis of who's who in the leadership, you find all these guys with former Ba'athist pedigree who have sort of fused together with these pure jihadists to create this sort of bastard organization. And I think that explains a lot of why this organization is so vehemently anti-Shiite, why it's so um, committed to violence in, the, in you know throughout Iraq to establish its goals in Syria and elsewhere. It explains a lot of behavior when you get into that. 
But it's neither a pure Ba'athist organization nor a pure Al-Qaeda organization at this point. It's its own thing. And it's pursuing its own agenda. And what is that agenda? Well, it's basically to install, think of it in these terms, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi as a dictator. He's essentially a dictator in the making. That's what he wants to be. If he's successful, if he's successful, he will be a dictator over a large portion of territory. And he'll be a dictator who will be a, a force to reckon with. Now, what does that mean from our perspective? Well, take a step back again and look at this from the insurgent or the political revolutionary's point of view. Because a terrorist is somebody who can comes in and commits a mass casualty attack or you know, a spectacular terrorist attack because they want to try and accomplish some near-term goal. The insurgent is somewhat of a higher life form on the political revolutionary curve. The insurgent is someone who is a little more sophisticated, who is, who is really challenging for political power. And what's amazing about the Islamic State of Iraq since April 2000, 2010, is they've gone from a force that was basically driven from being a full-blown insurgency, capable of challenging the power of the Iraqi state, and certainly at the time not even the Syrian state, down to a terrorist organization, such that by late 2011, early 2012, they were committing about 70 attacks per week. Ten months later, ten months later into 2012, they were committing double that amount of attacks. And we've seen how quickly they went from a full-blown insurgency, suppressed down to a terrorist organization, to a full-blown insurgency organization again, such that they're now challenging for authority across two nation states. That's pretty remarkable if you think about it. We're sitting here in August 2014. I had to think about that for a second. Well, not, not enough sleep last night. We're sitting here in August 2014, and just as of April 2010, this group was considered to be on death's door. And now here in August 2014, we're worried because they've captured a large portion of territory across two nation states. And not only are they fighting the regimes or governments in those two nation states, they're also fighting their fellow jihadists, they're fighting the Kurds, they're fighting Shiite militias, they're fighting basically any takers that come their way. That's pretty impressive if you think about it from a fighting capability. That's something we shouldn't scoff at. That's a danger. That's, that's a group that is basically very sophisticated in terms of how they're capable of waging war. And so where does this go? Well, what we've seen, how this metastasize as a threat to us, as we've seen over time, right, they went from a terrorist organization to commit bombings in Baghdad, something like that, to a full-blown insurgency organization. The American-led surge of forces in Iraq presses them back to a terrorist organization. Now they come back roaring as an insurgency organization. Well, it was recently said that they're not even an insurgency organization anymore. Now they're a full-blown army. Because if you go through the pictures of their armaments, they now have captured from the Iraqi government, captured from the Syrian government, missiles, tanks, those types of things. Now, I don't think they're really necessarily a full-blown army yet, but they're on their way to that. That's what they want to become. Because that's, that's the ultimate guarantee to of the dictatorship that Baghdadi sort of envisions for himself and his, his fellow ideologues. Um, as that army progresses, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to give up terrorism. The threat of a terrorist attack in the West only grows. With our, as they gain in strength. It grows across, across basically the, the, the whole globe even, not even just in the West, but throughout the Middle East in different areas. You know, it's, it's very interesting um, how the world works. I was on the train ride down here this morning, and uh, there was a gentleman sitting next to me who I had no idea who he was, and I just happened to ask him who he was and start talking to him. And it turns out he leads a group of evangelical churches in Israel and throughout the other territories, surrounding territories. And I asked him, I said, well, what are you, what are you doing coming to Washington for? And he said, I'm coming to talk about the threat of the Islamic State to my people the Christians in the area. Really pr pretty amazing. He was that worried. He's in Ramallah. He's in all these other areas. He's that worried that he was coming to Washington to talk with his group about the threat the Islamic State poses. It's Across the region, you can people now see it that way. They, they see the threat, it's palpable, it's rising. Where it goes and how, how, how ultimately, whether they'll be successful or not in their political aspirations, we don't know. But here's the point. They're capable of an awful lot of violence, even if they ultimately fail. And they've been capable of an awful lot of violence to, the, to this point. Now, going forward, I want to say a few thoughts here on um, this idea that we can partner with Iran to counter the Islamic State. Um, 
this is basically nonsense <laughs> for a lot of reasons. Uh, first of all, one of the things as the nerd goes through through this stuff very detailed and, and carefully, Iran, very interestingly, has had no problem at times cutting deals with groups like the Islamic State. They've actually worked with Al-Qaeda throughout its entire history. They've worked with Zarqawi, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, who was the first head of Al-Qaeda in Iraq and who was butchering Shiites, and yet the Iranian regime was willing to work with him to a certain extent. The Iranians will cut deals with anybody. They even cut deals with the Taliban, who was historically their foe in Afghanistan. The Taliban and Iran were on the verge of war in 1998, and yet in 2001 they cut a deal to come together against us. Iran is not a partner in any meaningful sense of the word in this fight. Um, and that, that's for a lot of reasons. Even, even tactically, that's for a lot of reasons. I mean, think about what our successes were in Iraq during the war there. The successes came when American-led forces led the surge in Iraq with their Iraqi allies, and they were able to clear and hold the Sunni territories of, from Al-Qaeda. They were able to get rid of them, hold territories, kick them out, and basically suppress them. Right? That was the idea. Iran's not going to do that. Iran's not going to go into Sunni territories and ally themselves with the Sunni counterparts and tribes and the like. They hate each other. What Iran wants to do in Iraq is spread its influence and power in the Shiite-controlled areas. Now, paradoxically, that actually creates the opposite effect from what we want, because what the Islamic State and its allies are all about in their insurgency there in Iraq is actually, at the core of their ideology, is a very vehement anti-Shiite ideology. They believe in all sorts of uh, conspiracy theories about Iranian influence in Iraq, some of them true, many of them not. Well, if you invite Iran into Iraq, to basically, and they're already there in mass, then you think they're going to be your partner against them. All you're doing is further inflaming those ideas. All you're doing is basically giving more credence to some of the ideas that the Islamic State and its allies are basically built upon. Um, furthermore, the Iranian regime destabilizes the legitimate Iraqi government. And what we see in that regard is that basically the Iranian regime essentially devolves into a situation where it's terrorists versus terrorists because they sponsor all these Shiite militias as part of the force to fight the Islamic State and their allies. Well, you know, one of the things that I've heard argued oftentimes is, well, what concern is it to us? Let them fight it out, right? Bad guy versus bad guy. What, what harm can come of that? Well, I would say if you look to neighboring Syria, we've seen that logic play out. We've seen that idea play out. And the situation has not gotten better. And neither side has been dealt a death blow. And in fact, both sides have increased the number of recruits and increased their capacity for violence throughout time. So even as they are fighting each other, they are not diminishing their capacity for violence. That's been the experience since late 2011 in Syria. In fact, the capacity for violence has gotten only greater. Um, and that's just a way of saying that in Iraq, I think you can expect to see the same thing. As Iran continues the battle through its proxies, the Islamic State or any of its forces, recognizing it sometimes you're going to cut deals with them, um, this isn't necessarily going to diminish the threat. Iran is not going to be a capable partner in this regard, for us in any regard. And, of course, lastly, when it comes to Iran, they are vehemently anti-American. Right? And this is one of the things that I talk about Iran all the time. Why is it that they're willing to partner with Al-Qaeda or the Taliban or any of these groups that, that sometimes they're even opposed to? The reason is because they're both coming after the U.S. Right? And I often talk about Iran. It's interesting to me when you talk about the Iranian threat, people always talk about it in terms of the threat to Israel. And, of course, that's where the, the biggest manifestation of the threat can potentially occur, obviously. And, and Iran is supporting, by the way, Hamas, a Sunni group against Israel currently, and is supporting anybody against Israel that, that basically is willing to commit acts of violence against Israel. But in their schema, in Iran's schema, Israel is the little Satan, whereas the U.S. is the big Satan. Right? And when you look at Al-Qaeda and their ideology, it's not all that different. These groups, Islamic State and others, they sort of view the world the same way. And so that's just a way of saying that the idea that we can farm out any of these problems to anybody else and that ultimately they don't involve the U.S., I think is strategically short-sighted. It basically says that um, it, whether you want to partner with Iran and Iraq, which is a silly idea, or you want to let Israel fight these guys on their own or anything, or anything along those lines, sort of misses the strategic game. Right. It misses the whole point, which is that ultimately all these things are steps towards containing and damaging American interests and American influence. And if we don't lead, if we don't actually try and find the way forward, these groups will. And what we've seen in Syria, for example, where there was no real solution from the West proffered is that this 
revolution which started as just the Syrian people rising up against the Assad regime basically gets overtaken by extremists, including the Islamic State, including Al-Qaeda's uh, franchises, including other jihadist groups and hardline Islamist groups. That's because without any leadership from the West, without any leadership from the international community, you know, we may want to lead from behind, but our enemies are going to lead from the front. And that's what they saw. They saw a front for them to lead on, and they did. And a big part of what you're viewing right now with the Islamic State is that as well. The Syrian dynamic here, there are a couple things that led to its rise. One of them is, of course, what happened in Syria with this revolution there. And in Syria, What's absolutely fascinating, again, let's go back to the idea of we're going to let the bad guys fight amongst each other. The Islamic State has been fighting Al-Qaeda in Syria and Al-Qaeda's allies in Syria. The Islamic State hasn't gotten weaker. They've gotten stronger. Right? They've captured more territory. They've gotten bigger and badder over time. This has not been a net plus for international security by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, the Syrian war has, to a large extent, have fueled their capacity for a war capa uh, fighting capacity. So going forward, I, I think the message I want to deliver here today is more than anything else is, you know, some of these guys, you know, th their ideas can look silly, they can look delusional, they can look absurd, but that doesn't diminish their capacity for violence. They're ideologues who want to accomplish their goals, and they're deadly committed to it, and they're not going to give up. They're going to keep coming. And we've seen time and time again, whether it's Al-Qaeda, the Islamic State, we knock off a number of their leaders, they come back. Right? That's because they're not organized as a top-down terrorist organization. They're organized as an insurgency organization. They're spreading their seed. They're spreading the number of followers. They're growing as political revolutionaries. They're grooming the next generation to take over. That's what they're constantly doing. And unless we're going to think strategically like that, unless we're going to think in their terms about how we're going to stop them from doing that, they're going to keep doing it. And they're going to keep growing. And they may not ultimately be successful in achieving all their aspirations, but as I said earlier, they're going to kill an awful lot of people in the meantime trying to achieve it. And the threat is not just to us, but it's to all of our allies. It's throughout the entire Middle East. And it's through all these people. You know, I, I say this all the time. You know, as somebody who looks at, uh, you know, all these nasty videos, beheading videos and nasty suicide bombings and all sorts of nasty stuff, one of the most disturbing images I see as a father of two young girls are these images of children wrapped in the Islamic State's flag or wrapped in the Al-Qaeda flag. They're being indoctrinated from birth into this ideology. Terrorists don't do that. Terrorists aren't interested in indoctrinating from birth. Political revolutionaries are, right? And they're thinking that way in terms of the next generation. You know, one of the things that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed said when he was captured, the mastermind 9-11, what he told the CIA, this has been popularly reported, is that, you know, you guys think that because you got me, this is the guy who planned 9-11, you, you, you guys think that because you got me, it's all over, right? But we, what we realized about you a long time ago is you guys think in terms of presidential election cycles. We're thinking in terms of the next generation. Right? That is a different ball game. That's not a drone striker away or two from, from victory. You know? That's a very different ball game. And unless we start having that conversation as a society about what this actually means and what these guys are actually trying to accomplish and take them seriously as political revolutionaries, we're never going to get to a point where we can actually defeat them. We're going to be, I'm going to be having this conversation. Look, I'm standing here in August 2014. Al-Qaeda was founded as a political revolutionary group in 1988. Think about that. 1988. Most of their existence, they've been hunted by the world's lone superpower. They're still alive. They've spawned new groups. They've reestablished themselves in different countries. They're still going. Why is that? Right? What is it that is at the heart of what they're trying to do that makes them potent like that? Why is it that the Islamic State is still going? We take out their leaders and they regenerate themselves and they actually end up capturing more territory. Why is that? Right? So as Americans and as, as friends of Israel, friends of other countries, we have a lot of allies in the region throughout the Middle East. We have allies in Iraq from the Kurds, the Iraqi people. We have allies in Syria, including many of the people who were originally involved in the uprising. We have many Muslim allies. You know, they're just basically screaming for help against this thing. And yet most of our arguments in this country are about why we shouldn't help them, or why we shouldn't get involved, or why we shouldn't do anything to stand in their way. That's short-sighted. Right? All that does is feed into our enemies' designs. All it does is make them stronger, make them coming. Because guess what? If we don't help these people, they're either going to get killed or they're going to get converted. Because that's the way our enemies operate.